some point I want to switch over. I'm going to show a few slides. Thanks, Patty. Um, I could have gone on listening to you for a long time to hear about things which I don't know much about and which I don't yeah. think are tremendously relevant to my project, <laughs> like, for example, place cells in, in, in the brain. Um, you're right that, uh, uh, I mean, I'm interested in, in, in how uh, animals have evolved to model a particular aspect of the world they live in. I emphasize, because I think it's the most primitive level, and I think it's the one which has stayed with us, and that's why it's an evolutionary story, I emphasize the way in which they model their interaction with the stimulation arising, uh, reaching their body surfaces. And that's why I'm interested in the way in, in, in touch and in sight and in hearing and in, and in pain, for that matter, smell, not so much in proprioception, because that's not a matter of something being done to me, it's a matter of what I'm doing. Um, and I think that, uh, and that's why I would say it uh, yesterday, I don't think actually proprioception or vestibular information has an, any interesting phenomenal component to it. But these other senses do. Um, and uh, uh, the, my, what I've, my project has been to try to understand what is it like to feel oneself to uh, be the subject of you know, light, light rubbing at one's eyes or sound at one's ears or pressure on one's skin. Why does it feel like it does and what's the point of it feeling like this? that? And incidentally, why do we even bother to represent that level? Um, I wouldn't call it Jesse's intermediate level because I think it's actually a parallel path. It isn't on the route to perception, but nonetheless, it's, it's very, very, very close to him in thinking that's the level at which phenomenal consciousness arises and it arises Interesting enough, not as a simple, simple representation of stimulation. It has this other component to it. Something has been, some extra oomph has been added. And I'll come to what that might be and, and, and why it might be as well. Now, you started off by uh, talking about my, my, the use I make of recurrent circuits and attractor states. That's almost incidental. I could, my theory could stand up without any of that. It's a, but I'll tell you how those came in. Um, in trying to understand sensation and how we re do represent what's happening at our body surfaces, I argued partly on phenomenological grounds, partly on historical uh, evolutionary ones, that actually the way we find out what's going on about, at our body surfaces is we monitor what we're doing about it. From far, far back in history, animals evolved reflex responses, expressive responses, just, I call them wriggles of acceptance or rejection to deal with the immediate proximal, proximal stimulus. Early on, there wasn't any representation of that. It was just what you did. Um, as, it, as things moved on and animals became more interested in making future judgments and planning and prediction in, in Andy's term, they wanted actually to represent what was going on at their body surface. Well, there was a very a simple trick which they could use to do that. They simply had to pay attention to what they were doing about it. Um, and interestingly enough, that would tell them actually rather more than just what the physical parameters were, uh, where and when and what kind of stimulus it is. It would also tell them something about what it meant to them, how they felt about it, because that was all built into the earlier uh, evolutionary story of making an expressive response. And so I've argued that animals hit on this trick of monitoring their own response. Rather, as you said, in, in, we know we get, you can use a recurrent signal to see find out what you're doing. Now, after a bit, um, the animals stopped making those early primitive expressive responses. You can't go through life wriggling in response to salt or whatever it might may be. But nonetheless, by that time, the animals have become hooked mentally on having these representations. So what happened next? The, the trick was, how can you get the representation of what you're doing without doing it? Well, my story is that what happened was that the ex ancient responses became internalized. Um, it, into, so that the responses were now no longer reaching right out to the body surface, but actually to somewhere on the incoming pathway, which was a sense of model for the, for the, for the body. Um, and in the particular hypothesis, I say actually, yes, it ended up with the responses being directed to primary cortex, or its equivalent functionally in, in earlier animals. Now, this is where the loops come in. Once you're making signals coming in, you're responding to it to the very point that the signal is entering, you've got the possibility of feedback. Um, and that, in my story, was where things went magical, or at least had the potential to become magical. It wasn't that this, in, this loop was serving any 
function in representing the stimulus, in representing sensation, is that once the circuit was set up, nature could play with it in all sorts of ways. You could give it dynamic properties, which actually would lift it into a different realm of, 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 of existence in which we would represent what was happening to us in a way which was, in fact, going beyond the stimulus given, was actually telling and, and, and beyond what we actually felt about it, but which that actually now had, had the potential to add a further dimension, the dimension which Keith and I think not Dan, but I we could regard as the magical dimension. I'm going to give you um, a, a very short demonstration of what I mean. The problem about all, a lot of this is that you know, I'm, by that point, I want to say, okay, sensation has become a show. Sensation has become more than just uh, a, a utilitarian uh, representation of what's happening at the body surface. It's become something which is on display to us in our inner theatre. And I'll argue, if we have time, about exactly why we should want to do that. But because Dan and others find such problem with this notion of a theatre, um, I thought I wanted something better than kind of bringing it down to earth with some pictures um, and a model. So can, uh, how do I turn the next? Oh, there it is. OK. Yeah. okay. Um, you see, I think you know, consciousness is, we, what we mean by consciousness is what is available to introspection. All the thoughts and beliefs and feelings and sensations and percepts, which at any one time are available to, to interact with each other and to guide rational decision making. Things which are not in consciousness on the whole, not relevant to, to, to decision making or to, or to continuing the internal uh, dialogue about what's going on. Um, and so I think the, we should use the metaphor. There's the theater with the structure of the mind on, in principle on display. Um, uh, okay. Okay, so uh, here's a look at the, this, well, obviously you see rather, rather uh, exotic structure which is there, but basically what we're seeing, what we look in is we see our beliefs, our desires, our intentions and so on. We see the structure which is basically driving the, the, the machinery of our mind. Um, and who's this on show to? Well, it's on show to the self. Um, what the self is, is the, in, is the, is the single uh, agent who has access to these, uh, every one of these intentional states has its own subject. What's remarkable about consciousness is that this uh, subject all comes to be, the one self, the self comes to be the subject in one person, if I can put it that way, of all these intentional states. Now, um, uh, so what's he going to be seeing there? Um, uh, that sort of just remind me where I was going. Shakespeare, um, I think I need to read this for uh, Shakespeare, in talking about the transductions which go on between the outside world and the, and the, and the theatre, um, uh, used in the introduction, prologue to Henry IV, part one, um, he talks about the grand illusion of the drama, uh, which was then working on the imagination of the audience. And he talks about the actors as being mere ciphers. Um, mere cipher, of course, being a, a symbol, a, 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 a number, which can somehow stand in for the events in the outside world. Um, he uh, he, he write, writes, but, or in the prologue writes, but pardon, pardon the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? And Shakespeare points out that actually you can do an awful lot with ciphers. Add a zero to 100,000 and you make it a million. Um, it's a very interesting example of an early understanding of how codes can begin to, to work um, in creating a drama. But um, I want to turn to that term, cockpit. Uh, Shakespeare's theatre was not, the, this was the Globe, but earlier his company worked in a theatre called the cockpit, um, which of course was traditionally a place where things were staged for an audience um, to enjoy. But the term cockpit then got taken over in use in the Navy. It was, became the, the cabin where the pilot was uh, in control of his ship and so on, and later, of course, adopted as the control room of an aeroplane. Um, and as it happens, I think the cockpit of an aeroplane um, provides an even better metaphor and perhaps even a model uh, for the workspace of consciousness uh, than a conventional theatre does. Um, and when 
So many issues are up in the air about what we mean by words like theatre and representation and double transduction and so on. I think there's nothing like having a mechanical model to think about to see just how much of it, of the works, it could actually deliver. So here's my model. Um, the Plaid's cockpit features a variety of independent instruments, which you can see there, which display the outcomes, output of subsystems that are monitoring a range of both external and internal states of affairs of that plane. Here on display are the plane's um, desires and its plans. You probably can't see it's not a big enough stage. You know, it's where it wants to go on the map. Um, it's, uh, uh, its speed, etc., um, and the state of its engines, and so on. All of them, of course, represent in the cockpit, not speed isn't represented by a rushing wind or whatever it is, or height by height. They're represented by numbers. Um, this is a single transduction. It hasn't got to be a double transduction. It's no, it's no, no point as speed turned back into speed, that's for example. And in this uh, cockpit, of course, oh, well, sorry, that's to give you a better picture of the kind of thing which is on display there. Conventionally, in the cockpit sits a pilot. Um, Let's call him the conscious self, the one who has access to all this information at once. From his privileged seat, he's able to integrate, to observe and integrate all the relevant different sorts of information, maybe excluding some from attention uh, or, or bringing them back into it. Um, but of course, not having all the information about everything which is going on in the plane, only the kind of things which are relevant to his job as a pilot in guiding it in adaptive ways to fulfill whatever the plans are. Um, and he, of course he does have motor controls as well. Uh, you can see the joystick down there which allows him actually to, to, to man maneuver the plane. He's got a radio, he can phone, he can talk about what's going on in the plane back to the control tower and so on. Um, and, uh, He's not, you know, it's not his job to manage everything. Lots of it's taken care of by uh, automatic servo systems and the wings and the engines, which he doesn't need to know about. But where it comes to it, he has access to this information, and in principle, he can use it to direct the plane's, the, the plane's behavior. Now, let's note that this pilot, uh, there he was. Uh, He's, you know, I've drawn in someone with a head there, but of course he doesn't need to be um, uh, anything other than a robot. And in fact, we could replace him with a circuit board of some sort. If the plane could be on 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 autopilot, um, and it could, all those functions could still be being pres preserved. The, the, the integrated circuit sir, can actually access this information, int make decisions, um, do all the adaptive things which the patient, which the pilot, is meant to be doing with the, with with, with, with uh, in, in his role as, as as the self, as the ego in charge of this. Um, so in a sense. The pilot doesn't need to be conscious to be conscious, and it's a very important thing to say that. This can all be done by, by um, a system which is thoroughly unconscious, um, although in making this repre these representations, it begins to, uh, uh, to now be describable to us as having effectively conscious access. Okay, well, that's basically that's the model, but you might want to say, and I think um, in this room many would say, that this isn't a model of the consciousness we're interested in. I mean, I think we have to allow that, that there is that, this term of consciousness, the theater of consciousness is having access to all these things, which don't have to have any special phenomenal content to be deserve the name consciousness. But there's something else which we care about about consciousness, uh, which really be, I mean, seems to lift. I mean, this, this can all be solved as part of David's uh, easy problem to solve how uh, a, a pilot can take that kind of control, or we can take that kind of control in our head. Uh, nothing magical going on there yet. Um, so I want to make the point to you, yes, there's nothing magical going on by, by in fact, uh, giving you some pictures here. Um, uh, here uh, is the plane responding to a signal from its uh, one of its wings. It's a fire alarm, basically. We've just observed that in our in, in on our own ship. Um, and here's a boy uh, responding to a flame on the, his periphery as well um, by something uh, an alarm going off in his head. Now, for the plane, of course, what's on display in its cockpit? Okay, just a, a symbol. It says fire. Um, a symbol, no doubt, appeared in our captain's bridge um, a short time ago, saying the, play, the engine room was on fire. But what's going on in the boys' cockpit? Well, something which, at least, I can, the best I can do on my PowerPoint, is a little bit more than just 
uh, a number, uh, 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 something which provides the information that the wings wings on fire. Um, so that's, I think, the question which we have to ask: Why do certain sorts of information get represented in the cockpit of our heads as having an additional dimension, something not required for simply supplying the information as such? Um, why do we introduce some magic to it? Well. Um, I, I, I want to su suggest that actually we can make perfectly good models of how that might happen. I'll come to the why in the moment. Let's suppose, in fact, that uh, this plane has got a set of sensory receptors, and they have a different kind of uh, display panel from uh, the others. Um, so these are the these are the ones which, in fact, are. Come here. OK, uh, representing sensory states. And what's on display here, I'm trying to put that across, is that the display in these cases isn't just the flat numerical algebraic or numerical display. Somehow, uh, these output of these is appearing as a hologram inside uh, the, co the, the cockpit. The, the information is still all there, but it seems to have taken off. It seems to have acquired another dimension to, uh, to the way in which it's being represented. And indeed, um, the pilot sitting in his, um, in his uh, cabin and seeing these numbers coming out of him um, begins, and in fact, in, in, in the way this is represented in, in his head, in the work, uh, it means that suddenly the cockpit becomes full of these strange sorts of display, um, things which most of the other instruments aren't involved with. But um, this isn't running quite as it should on the on, on the on the computer. But what's what's happened then uh, is that we've moved from a state where the you know, the the um, pilot had information coming in, then for reasons which we haven't yet talked about. Some of the information became especially attention-grabbing and, and, and significant to the pilot because it was being represented in a way which seemed to lift it outside the banal presentations which dominated the rest of the, of the, of the plane's uh, displays, the, the instrument's displays. Um, and in the story I'd like to tell about that is that this pilot sitting there, in fact, begins to find this uh, an astonishing experience to witness from the inside. Um, he radios back to, to, to the, the base, continually reporting about the wonders of living in the presence of these strange holograms. He wants to talk about them to his neighbors when he gets home and so on. Um, he actually will go flying just in order to experience the magic of these displays, um, which uh, seem to be a kind of gift which he, he would hardly have expected from pure, the, pure, the machine which, in which he's, he's, he's immersed. Now, that's my model of it, and I think it would be quite easy to, you know, we can, we can build something like that. And I'd like to suggest that actually, in functional terms, we can map on out most of the things which I've mentioned there onto aspects of the mind, onto aspects which we find significant and yet not entirely easy to, think, to know the words to think about them or how to see they relate to, to one another. If we can build it, then in a sense, we're at least halfway there. And some of the, you know, the worries will begin to disappear. Uh, if it, that's what all it is, then that's all it is, although what it is is, in fact, uh, may turn out to be uh, the key to the whole mystery of of our sense of who we are um, and why we believe we're alive in the world and so on. Now, the bigger part of my the story, which Patty, of course, didn't have time to get onto, is the question of exactly why evolution took this route. Why did uh, she find it uh, advantageous, or, was it, or, or did natural selection begin to, uh, to, to, to privilege uh, individuals who began to have these internal experiences and change their behavior in ways uh, which were, in some direct sense, a response to that. It, these displays change the psychological pro profile of the subject who's at the center of them. Um, and my story about the why of consciousness and the why of sensation has been preserved and and, 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 and has elaborated in the astonishing ways it has been. In fact, been given, dis given um, illusory qualities, uh, just as the, uh, the hologram is actually an illusion. There's no three-dimensional uh, display underlying uh, a hologram. It just looks as if there is. Um, in many of the things, the, the, the 
the aspects of consciousness, which phenomenal consciousness of sensations, which puzzle us. I think to, I want to argue in exact, exactly the same way have, uh, have been a, a result because a display is represented to us which when we monitor it in the theater of our mind, we can't but see as having dimensions which it doesn't really have. To come back to Dirk's point, or not quite Dan's point, but I think Keith, some of Keith's points. And I use, then I come back to my attractor states and so on, and I show how actually certain qualities of recurrent circuits um, can actually begin to have, uh, if you try and describe what is going on in this, uh, in, in this, in this loop, you find that uh, not only you don't have, it's not easy to describe in two or three uh, dimensions or whatever it is, but you soon get to a point which you can't describe what's going on in real terms at all, and yet there is a description. Um, it may require an infinite dim number of dimensions in order to actually pin it down. There are, are the uh, there is abs, you know, you can, there's an attractor state can have real qualities which actually couldn't um, be described uh, in anything other than imaginary terms. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's why I think where I'll, I'll leave my story at that point. But, um, and uh, partly I'd like to challenge Dan to say what's wrong with this kind of theater. It's not a Cartesian theater. It's a theater which is doing a job. It's a theater which actually corresponds to our sense of what we discover when we look inside our minds. And it seems to me it's one which we can, which we can cash out in perfectly good mechanical terms if and when we, we need to. Right. Cool.